Welcome to the Change Your POV Podcast. You're listening to Headspace and Timing, a show dedicated to breaking down the stereotypes of veteran mental health. I'm your host, Dwayne France. Let's get ready to make sure that your headspace and timing is set correctly. Hey everybody, welcome to Headspace and Timing. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for checking us out. As many of you who serve know, the M2 machine gun, the 50 cal, is one of the greatest weapons in the military's arsenal. The weapon's headspace and timing isn't set right, however, it's just a huge chunk of metal. Veterans can be rendered inoperable if their headspace and timing is not set correctly either. That's my mission here, to raise awareness about veteran mental health and reduce the stigma against seeking support. Each week we'll talk about different aspects of veteran mental health and interview mental health professionals that are working with veterans, service members, and their families around the country. Hey folks, Dwayne France here, joining you again for another episode of Headspace and Timing. I want to thank you uh, for taking the time to, uh, and uh, and I appreciate your interest in sort of my views on veteran mental health uh, and uh, some of the discussions that we've had. You know, last week we talked about uh, the first of a, a two-part series that we're doing here on Headspace and Timing. Uh, about uh, eight things that a veteran wants their mental health counselor to know. You know, I think it's extremely important that mental health professionals take the time to understand the cultural aspect of military service and uh, how the veteran's time in the military impacted them. Uh, it's often one of the most critical barriers that veterans face when we seek mental health services. The need to explain ourselves uh, and their service to a provider that has little to no understanding about their experiences. I've heard veterans say that uh, they almost feel like they have to have a dictionary sometimes uh, when working with uh, a therapist uh, so that um, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the therapist will understand what they're talking about. Uh, you know, veterans will say, you know, this one time we were being sniped and we got hit with an IED and blah, 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 blah. And by the time that they got to the end of the story, uh, the, uh, the therapist is like, and what's an IED again? You know, maybe that's a... Uh, a, a pretty extreme example, but when uh, when we start talking about uh, the Argandab Valley uh, or the Dora Market uh, or Rusafa District or Ramadi, um, you know, or, or a lot of different locations, you know, being able to understand some of the more significant things um, or, or even some of the more significant times uh, when a veteran served. Um, if a veteran said, uh, you know, they were in Afghanistan in, in early 2002, um, that means that they were um, probably in, in pretty austere conditions. Uh, or if they mentioned that they were in uh, Helmand or Regional Command East Afghanistan, um, I, I think it's very important for a mental health professional to understand uh, what it's like uh, for uh, the client. Uh, that's one thing that uh, when I uh, start to work with new veteran, um, whether a combat veteran uh, or, or even served in a time uh, in a different location, uh, maybe in a different era, a Cold War veteran, I'll take the time to do a little bit of research to understand uh, uh, what they experienced, uh, what they, um, you know, the the area where they were at. You know, so if somebody says uh, that they were in Basra in um, 2007, um, you know, I'll take the time to, to maybe understand a little bit of what was going on so I don't have to have the veteran teach me about uh, maybe what their experiences are. Uh, so that's really what uh, what the intent of the the last episode was. If you haven't listened to it, uh, I suggest you do. Uh, you don't have to specifically uh, before you listen to this episode, uh, but it really is a good contrast between um, what uh, what a veteran wants a mental health professional to know, uh, and then maybe what a a therapist uh, might want a veteran to know. Uh, that list uh, that podcast was uh, was recorded from my own experience as a combat veteran. And for what I've learned from veterans of my own work, uh, this episode is going to be looking things from the other side based on my experience as a mental health counselor. There are some definite misconceptions about the mental health counseling profession. Uh, it's perpetuated by stigma from the, uh, the stigma from peers, veteran peers, and the community, as well as from veterans themselves. Uh, we don't want to be seen as weak or damaged. Uh, and although seeking help is not weakness, 
Um, if, uh, if I had a broken foot, I, I've done it before, you know, I'd go see a doctor without thinking that you're weak or damaged. Uh, so maybe uh, these thoughts uh, can help overcome some of those misconceptions. So the first thing that a, a therapist, a mental health professional wants a veteran to know that uh, this isn't about Freud on the couch. You know, everybody has that uh, sort of misconception that uh, it's going to be, you know, a, a, a guy with a goatee who just nods and, and, and you know, asks you about your mother. Um, it, it, and it's not necessarily going to be that way unless your mother is the problem, but uh, um, Freudian psychoanalysis is only one therapeutic discipline, uh, and, and that's not really widely used, especially um, when, uh, when working with a, a therapist that a veteran might come in contact with. Uh, so, you know, that first misconception is that, uh, you know, uh, I'm just going to have to be here for years and years and years, um, and that's not really the case. The second thing that a therapist wants a veteran to know about uh, veteran mental health is uh, this stuff actually works. There is actually an extremely good chance that working with a mental health professional will resolve some of the challenges that veterans are experiencing with anger, depression, anxiety, relationships, just about anything. There's no need to continue to suffer. If someone who knows what they're talking about can help relieve that suffering, most therapeutic modalities provided by competent professionals are effective in resolving these concerns. Third thing that a therapist wants a veteran to know is that, uh, yeah, you are going to have to talk about what's bothering you. Yes, at some point you're going to have to talk about what is causing you to reach out and seek help. There are some therapeutic styles that don't require this at all. Sure, uh, things like uh, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR. Um, there are some that require a lot of it, like cognitive processing therapy. Uh, the, the thing about uh, this particular point is you're not going to have to do it right away. It's not like you're, you're going to sit down and, uh, and, and you know, start revealing the worst day of your life. I've actually um, talked with veterans that on the first day they meet, they do want to talk to me about this, uh, those, those bad moments. And I have to say, you know, let's slow down. Let's take it slow. Let's learn some, some coping techniques on, on how to deal with the emotions, understanding what the emotions are, uh, in, in, in determining how to, to, to cope with those reactions that recalling these events are going to bring about. And, and most importantly, in the beginning, uh, learn to trust your counselor, learn to trust your therapist. Then when you're ready, when you understand how to cope and when you, you trust your, your therapist to the point, then we can talk about those events and, and we can uh, learn what we need to do to kind of put them in their proper place. Uh, the fourth thing that a therapist wants a veteran to know uh, really goes along with uh, number three. You are going to have to talk about what's bothering you and it's not going to be as bad as you think it's going to be. How much worse could it be than the nightmares, the intrusive memories, the constant hypervigilance that's keeping you on edge all the time? It's actually helpful to talk about it as something that I hear from veterans all the time. It's if these, these thoughts are trapped in your head, nowhere to go, so they just keep bouncing around, gaining speed and getting bigger and bigger until they shred everything inside. It's another article that I, I wrote about, uh, and I'll link to the show notes uh, to this article, uh, about uh, the the rubber bullet uh, of the veteran's thought, you know these bullets are are bouncing around with such you know velocity and they're trapped inside of our head and they never get out. By getting it out of our head, by talking about it, we can examine how true these memories are and whether or not we have the the right attitudes about them. If we avoid seeking help for the broken foot because the fear of the pain of surgery is too much, then we're going to have to live with the pain of the unbroken and poorly healed foot. If we avoid seeking help for uh, the mental health concerns that we have because the fear of revealing them is too much, then we're going to have to live with the pain and suffering of the unresolved concerns. The fifth thing uh, that a mental health professional wants a veteran to know is that it is not all about pills and meds. Uh, this is another huge misconception um, uh, that, that a lot of veterans have, especially with the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. Now, I know quite a few uh, professionals, especially where I'm at here in Colorado Springs, that work for the, the Department of Veterans Affairs, both at the main VA and at the vet centers. Uh, and they are dedicated 
um, quality individuals. I would trust them with uh, with my life, with my my family, with veterans. I refer um, veterans that uh, that I work with to the VA often, uh, and tell them to seek out these professionals. Just because you go to the VA doesn't mean they're going to give you meds. And I know that that's contrary to what a lot of veterans experience. Um, it's, it's, you have the ability to be able to advocate for yourself to say, you know what, I'd like to try to figure this out without these medications. There are some mental health conditions that absolutely do require medications. Uh, things like uh, extremely chronic depression. Um, schizophrenia. There is absolutely no therapy that is going to address uh, schizophrenia, and it absolutely requires to be medicated. Um, a bipolar disorder, uh, that is a chemical imbalance that is only going to be resolved by medication. There are also some benefi- benefits to medication to control moods and emotion, especially when you first start seeking treatment. You know, I uh, tell veterans to to look at them as uh, training wheels. Uh, They're there to stabilize the bike until you can learn how to stabilize the bike on your own. There are differences between psychiatrists and psychologists and mental health counselors. I talk a little bit about that uh, in the first episode of Headspace and Timing. So you can go back and listen to that if you'd like. Uh, And uh, psychiatrists are the ones that prescribe medications. Psychologists and counselors, therapists do not. Learning how to cope with experiences without medication can help you reduce your reliance upon them. So even though many people believe that veteran mental health is about pills and meds, it isn't really. The sixth thing that a mental health professional uh, wants a a veteran to know is uh, that I actually do know what I'm talking about when it comes to veteran mental health. You know, I, uh, I didn't get this degree out of the bottom of a Cracker Jack box. Licensed mental health professionals have, at a minimum, a master's degree from an accredited program at an actual college or university. In order to obtain or to be working towards licensure in the state, uh, I have to meet very specific criteria for education, experience, and passing an examination. Uh, just like a doctor and a lawyer, I wouldn't be uh, able to do this job if I weren't qualified. Um, more importantly than, than just having the paper on the wall, um, where it's not just that, but more importantly than that, I understand the history, the theoretical basis and the techniques of my profession. I adhere to a professional code of ethics and I'm a member of a professional organization that helps me maintain my understanding of the mental health profession. If you trust nothing else about a therapist from the beginning, trust that they have the training and experience to get to help you get to where you want to go. Uh, This is sometimes a challenge that a lot of veterans have is they think they're going to a therapist or they think they're engaging in some type of adjunctive therapy, um, which they're great, and I'm going to have many uh, practitioners of of embodied uh, um, therapies and uh, uh, um, uh, therapeutic yoga, um, uh, equine therapy, all of these different things. I'm going to have... Um, guests like that on um, on the show, but if you are actually sitting in front of a licensed clinical mental health professional, then they absolutely do know what they're talking about. The seventh thing that a mental health professional wants a veteran to know is, um, at least from my standpoint and many of the colleagues that I work with, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to give you advice. Uh, this isn't Dr. Phil or, or Dear Abby. Um, chances are you have more than enough people in your life telling you what you should or shouldn't do, but that's not what a therapist is there for. You know, I tell therapists uh, that I work with, I'm not an answering machine, I'm a mirror. I can ask questions, I can make statements, I can help you understand how your experiences impacted you. Uh, I can help you become more aware of why things are the way they are and how they affect you today, but I'm not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. And a lot of times we do enough of that ourselves. Together, uh, myself and a client uh, and a veteran, together, uh, me and the veteran can examine how they think and what they believe, and they may be able to come to a greater understanding that you don't want to think or believe things in a certain way anymore, but I'm not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. Uh, If that's what you think that a therapist is there for, um, if, if that's what you're looking for, just tell me how to stop feeling this way and I'll do it then that's maybe another misconception that we can work on uh, when, you, uh, when you go to see a therapist. The number eight 
Um, if, if you and I don't click, uh, then let me find someone who you do click with. One of the challenges a lot of veterans have uh, when it comes to veteran mental health is that uh, when you were in the military, you really had some limited options whenever, you, whenever it came to who you were going to see. Um, you had your assigned provider, whether it was the battalion PA or your embedded mental health or whoever was assigned to your unit. If you and your doc didn't get along, too bad. You know, that's uh, sort of the only the way it was. Um, and, and I understand that things are changing now that a veteran does have a choice. If they're not feeling comfortable with who they're working with, they can request someone else. Um, but uh, even then, it takes a, a little bit of advocacy on the part of the veteran. It doesn't have to be that way once you get out. Not everyone works in the same way. I've had veterans that started to work with me that didn't connect with the whole military NCO turned counselor thing. I'm a big guy. I was obviously senior NCO when I was in the military. I've got my uh, guide on for my time as a first sergeant hanging up in my office, you know. Um, and, and some veterans have a real problem with that as their experiences in the military were around not trusting guys and gals like me. Not a problem. Let me find someone who you can work with. Let me find someone you know, who, who you do have the ability to connect with. I'm a professional that keeps things professional. And if I take the fact that we don't have a a personal connection or we don't click, um, if I take that personally, then I'm not keeping things professional. It's about the veteran. It's not about me as a therapist. It's about your needs, not mine. And so another real quick episode, uh, just a, another bookend that uh, is, is a little bit about um, eight things that a mental health professional wants to know. If you're interested about some of the other things and you hadn't listened to the previous episode, I recommend that you go back and do that. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, on the, the, the iTunes feed or, or on the uh, Change Your POV network, uh, pay, Change Your if you do want to go back and uh, listen to the uh, other episode, Eight Things That a Veteran Wants Their Mental Health Counselor to Know, uh, you can uh, find that on the Change Your POV Podcast Network website at www.changeyourpov.com. Uh, I recommend that you do take the time to listen, uh, whether you're a veteran, whether you're a mental health professional, whether you're just somebody that's interested in learning a little bit more about both. Um, these, uh, this little two-podcast uh, series is a... Uh, a, a good way to, to kind of check some things out and, uh, and, and understand a little bit about what we're trying to do. Uh, the most important thing that I want you to know uh, is that uh, what the mental health professional truly wants to do and is able to do is help. And that is the primary thing. Thank you again for joining me on this episode of the Uh, Headspace and Timing Show. Uh, I look forward to uh, hearing your feedback. Please uh, go uh, drop me a line on LinkedIn or or, uh, go over to the Change Your POV website and uh, let me know what you thought about the show. Feel free to join us on Facebook uh, at the uh, Change Your POV Squad. I'm going to have a link to that uh, on the website uh, on the show notes as well. And uh, definitely look forward to hearing what your thoughts are. Uh, Did I forget something here? Uh, Is there something here that you think is off base? Um, Is there anything that you think that I should take out uh, or anything that I should add? Definitely would like to hear from you. And I look forward to hearing you uh, join us on subsequent episodes of the Headspace and Timing Podcast. (laughs) 